You guys know I'm Tammy Haddad, and I'm here speaking on behalf of our great girlfriend, Connie Milstein. Let's hear it for Connie, who could not be here tonight, but she's such a great supporter of great women. We've got two great women up on the stage here, and I'd also like to thank our co-host, Kathy O'Hearn, back to Washington finally. Hillary Rosen, Don Lemon, every night. Hillary Rosen from 11 to 11.30. Thank you very much. Juliana Glover couldn't be with us, and the great Heather Podesta. <laughs> Carol Mountain, ladies and gentlemen, from Time Warner. No, you gotta stand up the whole way. Carol, thank you so much. And Connie Milstein, our Connie Milstein. Now, I clearly should be turning it over right now to the great Megan Murphy, who is now editor of Business Week. Oh, we knew her when. <laughs> She was running the Washington Bureau of Bloomberg and such a great friend. And Holly, can I just say, even though it's not my job right now, that it's an honor to be your friend. Oh. This book is remarkable. And we're so thrilled that you came to Washington, gave up that New York thing. I mean, we'll all be meeting you in the Hamptons later this summer, but I gotta be honest, it was hot all day and it wasn't because of the independent council. I just wanna be clear. All right, Megan Murphy. Well, thank you so much, Tammy. Thanks, Holly, for being here. So look, I want to talk about the book and talk a lot about the issues it raises. I, the book is amazing. It's a great beach read. Please grab it on your way out if you haven't grabbed it. Um, and it sort of surfaces stuff that I write a lot about at Business Week that we think a lot about in the current context, which is just the changing nature of America in yeah. terms of not just the haves and the have-nots, but sort of the super-haves, yeah. the sort of kind of haves, yeah. the want to haves, and the truly poor. Yeah. And you, you actually do uh, depict that society in a place that a lot of people don't think it exists, but that's the Hampton. Yeah, well, I think that the class conflict that's roiling this country uh, is shown in technicolor in a summer community, whether it's Nantucket or Martha's Vineyard or Aspen or some Lake Minnetonka or wherever it is on the coast of this country. What's going on between the 99% and the 1% is really testosterone fueled in the summer because these one percenters come in to their second homes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes their second homes in the Hamptons are $40 million estates on the ocean and they have helicopters and these people are worth half a billion dollars. Those are the uber one percenters. But even the one percenters that can afford a vacation home or even a vacation, you know, the rest of the country can't afford that. Mm -hmm. And so there's this amazing tension between the classes in these communities and that's you know, the lifeblood for any author. So that's the setting for my book, right? And I have spent about 15 or 20 years writing social satire. Why? Because I think wealthy people, I think people who have made it big in Manhattan, I worked for Tina Brown, the editor, for a long time after working at Newsweek, and I think the people that hit it big in New York are some of the most fascinating people around because they're so intensely neurotic. <laughs> and they're so passionate about what they do, and they're so insane in their drive, and it often comes from some crazy wound from their childhood, and there's these kind of narcissistic freaks that are running empires all over this Narcissistic country. Narcissistic freaks are running stuff? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know, it's amazing. I know you wouldn't think that in this country. How strange. And when I worked for Tina, I used to profile them all the time, and then I started moving into fiction because, um, as you and I were saying earlier, yeah. You know, fiction frees you up to write in a way to actually seek the truth a little closer because you're not constrained by all the, the rules that we have in journalism. You know, you can write about something very real when you write a novel. I hate those rules. Um, for those of you who haven't read the book, it sort of tells this journey of a, of a woman who lives in Portland, Oregon and has a quite happy life. I can, I can, I'm not spoiling yeah, anything no, by no, telling no. this, so just broad brush. So she lives in Portland, and she uh, moves for the summer to Southampton. It's called Southampton yeah. in the book. And that's one of the things. You don't call it the Hamptons. Call it Southampton, East Hampton, Bridgehampton. But and because she's in love with a, with a, not in love, sort of in lust with a, new, yes. with a new guy. And one of the things I thought was most interesting was how you depict not just the class conflict between newcomers to a summer community, but an, uh, you know, a, an embedded surfer community, a sort yeah. of uh, dedicated year-round community, but the tension between, let's call it the 0.00001% and the 0.01%. And yeah. I find that frequently in my job now that that's a more omnipresent conflict than we expect between the super, super, uh, uber wealthy yeah. and just the wealthy and yeah. how that's playing out and how that's actually shaping 
political discourse, socioeconomic discourse, shaping policy, et cetera? It's completely shaping policy in this country. And what you see is that these people that are participating in the stock market rises, right? They're, it's a very select group of people. You have to have enormous amount of savings in order to put it into something, in order to get the rush of profits like Niagara Falls falling all over you like these people have right now, right? There's not that many people that can pay for a house, pay for kids, pay for cars, and have that much extra to make money from. Mm -hmm. But these guys, mostly guys, unfortunately, but you know, that have millions and millions of dollars, they're making millions and millions of dollars weekly and monthly off these stock markets and hedge funds and all these things. And that's what's creating this just enormous divide between the 0.0001% and the 1% or 2%, right? Mm -hmm. And there is, there is tension between those groups because there's people, you know, if you think about Michael Douglas in Wall Street, right? When he was saying greed is good in the 90s or the 80s or whenever it that was. was the 80s. It was the 80s. Okay. <laughs> we were talking, you know, guys on Wall Street made a couple million dollars, right? You yeah. know, $5 million used to be a big salary, $7 million on Wall Street, even in the beginning of the 2000s. That was a ton of money. And then it just catapulted in this completely other level with the hedge funds and kind of post 2005 ish. And then those guys, because they had that cash, it makes insane money. Money makes money. And that's really what did it. And there is, there's anger and envy and like, how do you, how do you get there? You know, how do you do that? And of course, that's, that goes on between all kinds of people that are successful, accomplished people. One of my favorite vignettes in the book is this uh, story of this woman who's married to one of these uber millionaire, billionaire slash figures. And uh, the protagonist, I'm going to call her a protagonist, although she's conflicted, um, goes into a store. She wants to buy a bike for her and herself and her kid. And this woman comes in. The person's laughing has probably read the book. Yes. Yeah. My and favorite my favorite scene, too. And she just says, I want every single bike in this bike shop, you know, and it's this local bike shop. And she says, and the greatest, great, great writing, saying, you know, I also want the racks. You know, I also want the racks where you're stacking the bikes. And so she does, a, he does, a, the bike owner does a quick mental calculation, says, I bought the racks for 200. I'm going to charge this idiot rich person, you know, 5,000 or, you know, like he does a, you know, huge markup on it. And, and, and I think throughout the book, um, and I'm wondering if this was a conscious effort to portray the super rich as so divorced from the reality of the day to day. And does the real, the, the community you portray and sort of the real community, the surfer community that runs a day camp for kids, yeah. does that actually still exist? I mean, has it been overrun? I went back to the Hamptons for the first time in 20 years last summer. And I couldn't even I couldn't even get into the town. It was so yeah, trafficked yeah. with Mercedes yeah. and whatever, ever. You know, it was so um, so so overrun, so upscale. So you, I just want to get a coffee. No, I, I think could, you I know. Think is that, it? I think there's three worlds in my book. Okay, you've got the old waspy Protestants that run these country clubs, right, and drink a lot and play tennis with their Exeter roommates and you know are on their tattered <laughs> couches. And have money, but don't have serious money. That's a huge amount of people in the Hamptons, right? And golf clubs and tennis and all of that. And then you have these super rich, accomplished New Yorkers. But you also have a very vibrant local community with AV technicians and land surveyors and teachers and biologists and vintners. And you have, actually, all three worlds interacting all the time. You have them interacting on the beach. They have sex with each other. They play tennis together. You know, there's there's store situations, restaurant situations, social situations, and I've seen it myself because I surf, okay, and I spend a lot of time with the local community. I also come from a family of pretty large means in Manhattan, and so I've always had a nice house in the Hamptons. But I intermingle with all these people all the time, and I invite you know, surfer friends over for parties. And I watch how people treat them because if they're not going to advance them socially or professionally, they don't really want to talk to these guys, right? And I think, but that guy's so cool and he's so interesting and you'd really like him and you could, t you know, and I watch the snobbiness. I watch the sex. I watch the sparks. I watch the tension. I watch the incredibly awkward situations. Leslie, Kathy, who been at my, and Heather have been at my house many times, know, you know, they've seen it all interacting at once. And I think it's just, you know, I think it's interesting because I think it's what's going on in this country. You have all kinds of people interacting in ways that are uncomfortable. And There's, you also want people to get yeah. along better, you know, what's going on in this country politically. You know, we kind of want more empathy and we want people to understand each other. And we want people to talk. And so the book is really about these different worlds 
kind of trying to talk and get along. And I don't write caricatures. No. Like the rich people aren't awful and the local people aren't angels. You know, they're all, everybody's messed up in their I'm own way. I'm not going to tell you to buy the book, but there is a lot of sex in it. <laughs> so, <laughs> just, just so you know if you want to grab that on the way out. Uh, <laughs> But they made me tone it down. They made you tone it yes. down? Jesus, I, I know, was blushing. I and I, uh, <laughs> um, so, <laughs> You're blushing now. I, uh, so, so talk, let's talk, so much to unpack in that. Last, but so talk about a little bit about the surfing and then I, you know, and sort of how that, when you got into that and how it changed the way you looked at things and looked at the community and your interactions. It's been a big game changer for you. I mean, it has and it hasn't. You know, I grew up with a man who started out in a coffee shop. He was a Greek immigrant. And his parents uh, had a coffee shop that was open 27 years for 24 hours a day. And when they closed it at midnight the first time, they realized they didn't have a key because they'd never closed it. And uh, my dad went on to work in the Nixon administration and work on Wall Street. and. You know, he's giving probably 90% of his money away. He's 91 years old. He works every day. He turns the lights off. He buys tulips at the little Korean market on the corner instead of, you know, nice expensive flowers. You know, he's, he's like that guy who, he's had his same briefcase for, you know, 60-something years, right? So I grew up with that, right? I also worked at ABC and Newsweek, and I'm also a journalist. NFK. Yes. <laughs> and I like to... You know, I like to analyze situations, and I like to see things. So um, how did I write about this? I mean, I did start surfing. I did, you know, start really getting entrenched in the local population. I fell in love with someone I was surfing with. And, um, and then I started writing about it. And then I started writing about wealthy people. And then I started writing about self-made people. And then I started interviewing CEOs. I mean, you do this all the time, but I'm particularly interested in you know, the people at the top, how did you get there? Like, what did you do? What is this, what is the drive that made you leapfrog over divisions constantly that means you're absolutely number one with 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 people? In the country? What is it about you that did that? What drove you? And are you smarter than everyone? Are you savvier? I mean, what, are you just nervous all the time that you're just better at things? I mean, what is it? You know, I think it's fascinating. Mm. And those people that are at the top, you know, they're, they're anxious, right? They, they want to be real, and they want to be liked. And, and that whole social messiness of people who are, like you were saying before, who are so apart from the rest, but that are trying to jive with regular people is just so awkward and wonderful to write about, you know, and wonderful to create situations where if it isn't sexual, it's just a conversation that isn't quite working. OK, so final question. In all of your studies of, if we're looking at this as almost a zoological experiment, yes. what is the unifying characteristic of people you've seen that have taken it to that level of success? Whether they're flawed as human beings, whether they're yes. flawed as parents, whether they're flawed as, uh, in many aspects, what is the one thing that you would say joins them together in that pursuit of astronomical financial success? Raging narcissists. <laughs> <laughs> I would. I mean, I, I, if you look at the DSM-3 psychological guide, a narcissist is someone very often who's been wounded in childhood, and they're making up for it. And they spend their life kind of proving that, you know, getting the attention they didn't get as a child, or overcoming their dyslexia, or, you know, a parent dying or, you know, something that, that was really psychologically wounding, and they never get over it. And so they're, they're just going and going and going, seeking something that's filling some seeking enormously approval. empty emotional hole. I really, I totally believe that. I have, I have rarely met a hugely powerful guy that, you know, unfortunately, as I say, it's often men, but sometimes women, but, you know, that, that got to the top who isn't just unbelievably weirdly driven. Well, with that optimistic view <laughs> of the future. I mean, have you? Have you? Let me ask you that before we go. I mean, have you, you're running a huge magazine about this. I mean, have you met a lot of chieftains of industry that are kind of mellow and cool and not needing no, I attention? Agree. I agree. Um, narcissism is probably a unifying, and panic. Yeah. Panic and narcissism and, yeah. Okay. <laughs> 
Can't say too much. <laughs> Doesn't mean they're all, you know, mean. It just no. means that's what drives them. No, sometimes they have huge panic hearts. narcissists are some of the nicest <laughs> people I've ever met. Sometimes they're <laughs> fabulous and charming and fascinating too, right? Yeah. You know. So last summer when I did go back to the Hamptons for the first time, I went to this party, this Fourth of July party, and all these people had been. Uh, parents of kids who went to Buckley, yeah. where, was it Eric? I think Eric went to Buckley. And they were always telling the stories about how Donald Trump was so involved at Buckley, and he was so known and well-voiced, and they really respected him. And I thought it was really interesting that yeah. this uber-rich club, at the, you know, at yeah. this uber-rich club that people were saying, like, oh, we're so surprised by all this, because at yeah. Buckley, he did great for the kids. And yeah. it seemed like, from my minimal experience, that Hampton's crowd was sort of Sorry, I should say, you know, yeah. it was behind him a little bit. It was interesting. You know, I've been called by a lot of reporters mm. to try to figure out what's the social life of these people and how do they interact in New York yeah. and the kids. And I swear, I have never seen them. Yeah. I have never seen Ivanka and Jared. Not at a Park Avenue thing, not at a media thing, not at a Power Women thing. I think they just work. They go to Mount Kisco and they go to Mar-a-Lago. Yeah. So I think that's their social life of Jared and Ivanka, and I think um, Donald, and you know, they just, they roam around, you know, they just, they go out once in a while, but not a lot. And I do believe, I do believe he's like hugely magnanimous and yeah. kind of fun in some school situation. I mean, he just had Barron to the White House. I bet he was fabulous, you know, with the teachers and the kids. I mean, I completely believe that. It's interesting because when I read your, if, if you read, when you read, when you read the book, um, Donald is actually quite like Jake. And yes. he's, there's, as we were talking, there's sort of three uh, generations of wealth. You know, there's three yeah. types of wealth. There's like new wealth, wealth yeah. there's old wealth. And he's, he is quite similar to one of your characters yeah. in your book in terms of the way yeah. he is. But buy it, read it. Thank you. <coughs> thank you so much for thank coming you, to Megan. Washington. Thank you, Megan. Thank you. And thank go you. out to the Hamptons. And I would like to thank Connie and Carol and Heather and Hillary and Tammy and Kathy and Juliana for having us. Yes. Oh, and Kathy would like everyone to tweet the flip-flops that she got because they're so fabulous. And thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Megan. Thank you. Thank you.